You're listening to Stu's Show on Shokus Internet Radio. From Chatsworth, California, Shokus Internet Radio presents Stu's Show. Two hours of terrific conversation with great personalities from the world of television, both in front of and behind the cameras, plus your live phone calls. And now, here's the host of Stu's Show, Stu Shostak. If you recall back in March, a very, very talented animator, director, and uh, producer, Ray Pointer, visited our show, and we talked for the majority of that program about Ray's career, and we had about 20 minutes left over to start talking about what Ray's forte was, and that was the Max Fleischer Cartoon Studio. Well, you guys are in for a treat today because we are devoting the entire two-hour program to the legacy of Max and Dave Fleischer, and so would you please help me welcome back the one and only Mr. Ray Pointer! Thank you, Stu. Thank you for having me. Get your me applause. Back again. Thank Get you. your applause. Yes, that's right. Happy birthday, sir. Two days, July fourth. It's not only the uh, the the uh, the birthday of our country, but it's the birthday of Ray Pointer. Well, not only that, but people have asked me about what it's like to be born on the fourth of July, and I said, "Well, you've heard of the Big Bang Theory of Creation. Well, I'm a big banger." <laughs> Thank you so much. Welcome back. It is high time we had you back on because we are going to discuss the Fleischer legacy in as much time as we can today in the two hours. You will come back later in the year if we don't finish. Yes? Yeah, well, yes. anytime you want okay. me, I'll be there. All right. Even if it has to be by phone for reasons that will be discussed later, you will be available so we can continue. Absolutely. But this gentleman, you brought somebody with you today that it has been an absolute pleasure and an honor to be sitting here talking with the past hour before we've gone on the air here. This gentleman is a very important part of the Max and Dave Fleischer legacy because he is the nephew of Max and Dave Fleischer. He is the son of Lou Fleischer, the gentleman who ran the music department all of those years at the Fleischer Cartoon Studio. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you a very talented musician in his own right, the one and only Mr. Bernie Fleischer. Thank you, sir. And that's our show. Thanks for being No, no, we're just getting started here, sir. It is a pleasure, as I said, and an honor to have one of the Fleischer family sitting across from me here today. Thank you for... Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. For giving up your afternoon. And he is a star in his own right, too. We will talk about this later in the broadcast. Uh, Bernie, right, uh, Bernie's voice at age 10 or 9 appeared in a Fleischer cartoon, right? Yes. What's your name? I don't know. What's yours? Gee, I guess we haven't any. Look, we have names. Yours is Raggedy Ann. Mine is Andy. That's Andy. <laughs> All right, are you making fun of our guest here? <laughs> that was from the 1941 uh, cartoon two-reeler that Max and Dave made called Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy. And mm -hmm. our special guest here did the voice of Raggedy Andy. How did that come about, sir? Well, it came about through uh, nepotism. You know, I <laughs> happened to oh, know, really? I happened to know the music director. <laughs> and uh, it was funny because I originally sang the songs, too. And they didn't like that. So they left your voice in <laughs> They it? left my voice in as, as the voice of the character, but a lady came in. I've, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. A lady sang sure. for you? A lady sang for me, and oh, I was, I, that really bugged me. Oh, but how cool <laughs> to have your voice in a, in a cartoon. It, it was fun. But before we get into the Fleischer legacy with Mr. Pointer, let's talk a little bit about your career. You you played with one of my favorite all-time bands growing up in the 60s, the Baja Marimba Band. That was a lot of fun. And, that and was it was just wonderful. Experience. Julius Wechter, one of my favorite musicians outside. He and Herb Alpert were my two favorites uh, growing up, and I went to junior high school with Julius's son, David. I actually got to do some video work for Julius before he passed away. And just a great guy, great family, but it, I love it. It's all these Jewish guys pretending to be Latino. Yes, it was. It was so, great. Well, there were some Italians thrown in there, oh, too. Oh, okay, Italians and Jews were all the same. You know <laughs> right. that. Um, uh, how many instruments do you play, sir? Well, I, I play the woodwind instruments, uh, everything except bassoon. So saxophone, clarinet, flute, oboe, English horn. 
stuff. <gasps> I know, I know. The audience really, really enjoys it. Let's let's talk a little bit about your your professional career besides working with the Baja Marimba band. By the way, how many years were you with them? Well, we did five years with A and M Records, mm -hmm. and then Julius and I uh, became partners, and we moved over to CBS Records with Bell, mm -hmm. and we did two more years. Uh, and that was it. Yeah, that was it. But you're also, you've been a studio musician for years. You've worked on a lot of movies. Name some of the movies you've, you've played uh, music for. Well, I worked on most of the, uh, the Michelle Legrand scores and oh, Burt wow. Bacharach scores and yeah. with Andre Previn and... Uh, uh, gosh, I don't know. It's hard to remember well, all of it. But... Well, let's let's <clears throat> just sh to show everybody out there that they're not fooling around with kids here. You were also president of the union here, the L.A. Musicians yes, Union. Yes, I was president of, of Local 47. And what was Hollywood. the other organization you were president of? I was also president of the L.A. chapter of the Recording Academy. And, uh... The audience loves it, you see. <laughs> <laughs> So you you've had uh, a very rewarding career as a as a musician, and uh, are you are you uh, fascinated by what we're doing here on the internet with this? Yes, I am. And as I, I told really you, I am, am fully licensed with ASCAP and BMI, That's so wonderful. you'll be getting your your royalties. <laughs> maybe I don't know how they work, but we pay them every month. We turn in our playlists, and uh, they are supposed to divvy all that up. So you'll get your half a cent or whatever it is for for internet radio when we play soundtracks <laughs> from the movies. But Bernie, thank you so much for being here today. Well, it's my pleasure. And uh, the nice thing, gang, is that Bernie has some first-hand uh, recollections of being at the studio in the 1930s and in the 1940s, and uh, he's going to share those as we discuss our timeline today with Ray Pointer. So let's recap now. There were five Fleischer brothers. That's right. Max, Dave, Bernie's father, Lou, Charlie, and, and Joe. That's right. Okay, thank you. I'll take an applause for that. Thank you very much. Okay. They were primarily um, technically oriented. Okay. And some of that would be somewhat influenced by the father. And uh, it seemed like they all pretty much shared some artistic inclinations. They all could draw to a certain degree. But Max, the, the second brother, of course, he was the one who really pursued it as a profession. And uh, he had a tremendous admiration for comic strips and, and started out with the desire to be a cartoonist. All right, now... What was your dad doing at this time, Bernie? Your dad later joined his brothers when sound came in. That's correct. So what was he doing while Max and Dave were experimenting with animation? He was playing the piano in various Chinese restaurants. <laughs> and he actually played uh, in silent movies in vaudeville houses. And uh, it's interesting because uh, later, the development of the bouncing ball and stuff, he, he did actual screenings of lyrics and had the audience sing along this was with him playing the, the piano. This, this was before. Is way before. Okay. So and, and that's what he did. And uh, according so it, to my dad, he was really supporting all these crazy brothers who he, were doing he, all so this So he was behind it. Did he, did he have an inclination? He says, if you have a place for me, I'd like to be involved in this. Or was he just sort of backing no, him? No. He was going to college and uh, uh, he got a degree in civil engineering. And uh, he, I don't think, planned to go into the studio at all. All right, but now this, this brings me into Lou. Max and Dave thought, now that we have sound, let's get Brother Lou involved, right? How did that right. work, Bernie? Well, uh, at that time, um, my dad had uh, a background in both music and mathematics, and probably the mathematics were more important here <laughs> than the music because he was brought in to help them synchronize the uh, music and the uh, mouth actions with the wor actual words and all of that. And he developed a lot of the early techniques, the exposure sheets, and he developed the earliest click tracks so that they could record uh, the music and uh, sound effects to actually hit the right points in the film. Is that what a click track does? Is there clicks yes. every so often so that Yes, they... the musicians had a had a set of earphones and there would be a click in there and the click would be like a metronome. But it was not always metronomic. It was not always the same beat. It was related to the track that they were scoring. Wow. And that's how it worked. Now, did your dad at this point start doing uh, or running the music department for the... for? The... I'm not really clear on that because I, I wasn't born till 31. Well, we're almost right. there. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the music department uh, came into a formal being after they were reorganized. 
and so when sound was coming in that's when they revised the song films as screen songs and so what happened was in january of 29 they moved out of 1600 broadway and moved over to frank goldman's outfit as i mentioned to him before and for about that first six to eight months, they operated at the facility over at Queens. So their first sound cartoons were produced over there. Okay. And then they moved back in 1930, reorganized as Fleischer Studios. Is, and from that point, that's when they started to develop the formal music department, because previous to that, they were just taking 78 records and adapting them. And so I think at this point, Bernie can tell you exactly how Lou came in. He started at the Astoria studio. Uh, over in Queens, mm -hmm. and then uh, moved into 1600 Broadway and uh, built up the music department there. Uh, he Really, his job was to make sure that the music was properly recorded and synced up uh, with the cartoons, and he had to furnish the animators uh, the exposure sheets that they would work from. And uh, that was... Uh, that was basically his his work. He did not r actually write music. He was more of a music producer right. for the film. Overseeing and, it. And Overseeing actually, it. How, how, how Lou got into it was uh, uh -huh. David called him in originally as sort of like a little freelance job. And they had this 78 record of Eddie Peabody playing the, the banjo. So he took this record home. And uh, Lou's story, because he told me that story, yes, but he was on, on the L, and he had it under his arm, and the crowd swaying back and forth, and the record broke in half, <laughs> and he was nervous. He got off at the next stop, and he looked for a record shop to find another copy of the record. Mm -hmm. So he took it home, and he played it on their uh, record player at home as late as he dared. And the trouble of it was, there was only one volume setting on it. Loud! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so when he went in the next day, he said, I'm sorry, but this is the best that I could do under such short notice. And Dave was perfectly satisfied. He said, this will keep an animator busy for two weeks. Right. Wow. Yeah. And, and that it. was the beginning that of it. That was the start yeah. of it. Let's get Betty Boop into this. How did Betty Boop, it was right around this time, right? Right around this time. Okay, let's talk about how that, uh, who created it, how did it become a cartoon, and then we'll talk about the lawsuit a little bit. Right. Go ahead. Well, as I said, the uh, Inkwell imps were replaced by the talk cartoons. Like you have talking pictures, these are talk cartoons. And uh, these were some of the first ones where they actually had animated dialogue. Just a little bit before Disney was doing it, although a lot of things happened in parallel. Oh, wait. Yeah. And so the eighth one into the series had this storyline. It was, it was called Dizzy Dishes. And it's the usual thing about all these out-of-work actors who are really waiters in a, in a cabaret. Nothing's changed. <laughs> and so there was this incidental little sequence where there was this character that was singing this boop boop a doop song sort of patterned after Helen Kane. Now, at this time, Grim Natwick was working for the studio. He sort of filled the void when Dick Humor left to come out to the West Coast. Grim was one of the few artists at Fleischer Studio who had formerly studied art in Europe, and he was known for doing uh, good female drawings and so forth. So he was originally called upon by Dave to design this character that's a female poodle-type character to work with that version of what they generically called Bimbo. Bimbo changed from cartoon to cartoon until they finally finalized him in 1931. And the original drawing was very literal. It was a poodle 
with this human head on it that was sort of a caricature of Helen Kane. And Dave didn't think that was very funny. I thought it was scary. I know what you're talking about. I've seen that cartoon. But uh, he said, no, put a real woman's body on it. And so there's this kind of overweight woman with this, this funny head on it and so forth with the spit curls. And the girl that they brought in was Margie Hines, who later was one of the five women who was the Betty Boop voice, but not the most famous one. But she was the first one who did it as an imitation of Helen Kane. But it was never intended to be an ongoing thing. It was just a one-shot thing. Okay. But that sequence alone was such a standout. They had so many uh, reactions that Paramount immediately uh, pushed the idea of promoting the development of this character. And it remained sort of a, a half-human, half-girlish character, but they, they slimmed her down and they made the body a little bit smaller, made her cuter by making a, a larger head and so forth. But Grim Natwick had already left by the time the character had evolved into what we know now. So although the story's been repeated again and again and again that he developed Betty Boop, well, that's not entirely fair because the character as we know her really developed more so when uh, Nitel and uh, and Crandall and Bernie Wolf took over. And uh, we would just imitate him in drawing Betty. And she moved from the dog character to the one with earrings. The uh, Betty Boop then was named after the fact that Helen Kane went boop boop doop in her songs, right? That was a secondary thought. But originally, the, again, she didn't have a, a name. And then they just figured, well, Betty... And then the obvious outcome of that was Betty Boop. Come on, Betty! Betty, Betty! You left me sad and lonely. Why did you leave me lonely? Cause here's a heart that's only for nobody but you. What happened? How long after Betty Boop became a cartoon phenomenon did Helen Kane say, uh uh? What happened? The character started to get a lot of attention. In fact, she very quickly became the star of that series. And so they suddenly realized that they had a tremendous um, potential in, in this character. But actually, it was Paramount who was behind the idea of promoting the development of this character. Mm -hmm. And there was an actual trade ad that compared a photograph of Helen Kay next to a drawing of Betty Boop. They did this in publicity. Yes, they promoted the idea so of it. So guess what? Helen Kane sees this and says, oh, right? Now, in all fairness, Max Fleischer is credited with creating Betty Boo. The understanding needs to be that a lot of these things are structured on an old Victorian industrial structure in the fact that the figurehead of a company always is credited with the after effect, because they also bear the responsibility yeah. of what happens. Yeah, and as a which, side note to that, Mark Goodson always gets credit for creating The Price is Right and to tell the truth and all the shows he did. when Because it was, it's his company. Right, but it was actually Bob Stewart or one of the other people right. who worked for him. So, so I understand that. Right, I understand right. That. Go ahead. So Betty Boop was really the, the Fleischer Studios star character. Mm -hmm. And they realized that they were really onto something because she had something that worked on an adult level of humor. And they also had the advantage of not having restrictions at that time about what they could do. So quite naturally, there were a lot of sexual innuendo and very clever ways of getting those things across. Yes? Does Miss Betty live here? Yes? Yes? This is the moving man. Yes? Do you want to come in? Yes. All right, I'll wait till you take it off. Without being as, as literal and almost grotesque as what they are today. Right, but they still had problems with the Hayes office a few years later, right? Eventually, yeah. eventually when that was coming in. Yeah, all right, but so what prompted Hel Helen Kane then filed this lawsuit because they were making money on what she felt was her image? Right, well, what's interesting is that Helen Kane, first of all, she already had a career established on the stage in Broadway shows. And she had a recording career, so she was very well known. And there were all sorts of imitators. 
She was singing a type of a singing style that was quite common. She was not the only person who sang that way, mm -hmm. but she was the personality that was most associated with that singing style. So her film career started in 1929, and it was over in 1930 because Paramount was cutting back because they were starting to have financial problems, and it was the Depression. She saw the, the rise of the star of Betty Boop as hers was falling as unfair competition and that her personality was being exploited. There were f actually five people did the voice of Betty Boop in the cartoon, There right? were five women who were, were hired as imitators, two of which were hired uh, as lookalikes. Uh, that was the primary reason why Mae Questel came into the picture. At age 18, she won a contest. And the interesting thing is that Helen Kane awarded her the, the position of winner and autographed a, a picture to Mae Questel, the only other me. Yeah, but little did she know or, or think that Mae Questel would be supposedly imitating her. But now the story behind Mae Questel, of course, for those of you who don't know, and I'm, I'm sure everybody knows, went on to be olive oil uh, later That's on. That's right. And we'll get well, into she also did a lot of the, the female voices and children and barked for dogs and things. But anyway, let's get back to the lawsuit here. We're getting off uh, off on a tangent here. What happened? How did this thing get resolved? And it was it was Lou. It was Bernie's father that saved the day. Bernie's father finally saved the day, but the, the background of that was, of course, understand, too, that a lawsuit doesn't happen overnight. But, of course, these things were building up, and the Betty Boop character were, was becoming more and more popular, and everybody knew, basically, what it was a parody of. So, in 1934, she launched a lawsuit claiming that, number one, the cartoons were stealing her audience, number two, that it was a deliberate caricature of her, which it was, that they had deliberately copied her hairstyle and that they were also stealing her personality, including the, uh, the, the singing style. It almost got to the point of being ridiculous because uh, the New York Times was, was following this daily and all of the girls who had done the voices on the cartoons, they were brought in as as witnesses and they were asked to demonstrate and they were trying to make clarifications about the syllables and what's the difference between a boop and a boo boop a do and a poo poo be do and a do do de do and all of that sort of what thing. was the Fleischer stand on this that par it was parody and satire and that, that under the first amendment it was okay is that what their argument was all, all along that was here? never discussed uh, Paramount backed the Fleischers on that because she was suing two parties. She was suing Paramount and she was suing Max Fleischer and also Fleischer Studios. It was a three-way lawsuit that she had going there. So Paramount backed Fleischer, which they should have done because they were the ones who promoted They were the ones the that I, said develop that's, that's this character. Correct. Yeah. Now, that is the reason why publicly for the sake of the trial that Max took the responsibility taking the credit for having created her. Whether you want to say whether it was right or wrong, yes, there were those other people working under him, but to spare them from being involved, and with him being the figurehead of the company, yes, he bears that ultimate responsibility. So ideally, yes, he is responsible because it came under his Do you company. think there ever was a time during this uh, trial that Paramount didn't think they would emerge victorious? Were they worried? Yes. I, I know that my father was very worried that they were going to lose this suit. I was only a, a few years old, but uh, I remember that that was a, a big topic uh, later on, even later on. He told me that they came very perilously close to losing it big time. And then they would have had to drop the character or pay her a royalty or make her the voice or something. She was suing for $250,000. Which back in the 30s was like two and a half million dollars. That's today. right. Yeah. Yeah. So they had, there was a lot at stake here. So let's talk about how, how Lou saved the day. How did, it, how did it finally resolve? Well, first of all, the attorneys were trying to narrow it down to the singing style. Were there any of Helen Kane's recordings used in the cartoons? No. Was there similar song material? Yes. They had done covers of some songs that she had done, but they had one of these other women record the song. Were there any references directly to Helen Kane? 
In the first cartoon that started the Betty Boop series, Betty Boop comes out on stage and does these impersonations of celebrities. Each one of these is set up with a little placard photograph of the personality, and they animated the lips. Even got a little imitation from me, no. Okay, Fanny. The very first one is not set up that way. It starts where there's a long shot in the background. You can get the image that looks like the silhouette of Helen Kane, and it immediately cuts to Betty Boop singing, That's My Weakness Now. That was a song that Helen Kane made famous, but they do not have the intro of Helen Kane to establish that she's imitating Helen Kane. That has been cut out of the negative. So that was as a result of the lawsuit? They cut that out in order to not have any evidence because they were showing the films at the court. So they were comparing Helen Kane's films to the Betty Boop cartoons, trying to find if there were any deliberate parallels. Can you parallels. imagine if they left that if in? That, if they had let that in, she would have won. Let's talk about how Lou saved so the day. So how Lou saved the day was that they're, they're trying to di differentiate about the origin of the singing style. If she originated this singing style, then that would be the point. There had been one of those early test films that was done with Baby Esther. Someone got a hold of this, and they had to make a soundtrack off from the, the, the disc, and the print had some frames missing. And it stayed in sync until you got to the crucial moment of the boo 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 part, and it got out of sync because of the lost frames. So Lou sat up with the film cutter, Kitty Feister, all night, and they, Paramount had a cab waiting out in front to rush the doctored print over to the Paramount News Lab so it could run off a new dupe to show as star evidence the next morning. So they had to go through and figure out where to put in the slugs to keep it back into, into sync. And so that they did. They sent it over to the lab. They ran off a dupe, and they presented that the next morning as the star evidence, and that synced it. S cinched it. Well, it synced and it and synced it. Synched it. <laughs> You're right. Now let's give Lou a round of applause. <laughs> Way to go, Dad, huh? Yes. Yeah. And that was that. And how long did this trial go on? It went on for five months. Wow. And uh, uh, did it age anybody in the Fleischer <laughs> studio Apparently at all? Apparently not. No, because they that... came out very, very uh, victorious. And they looked very happy. In fact, there was a newsreel about it. Mr. Fleischer, as the originator of Betty Boop, what is your reason for selecting these girls to furnish the voice for your Betty Boop cartoons? Because they were all born with a certain something in their voices. You could tell that that was a prepared statement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the statements that he made in the court. Very, very interesting, and good for him. Now, the Boop series continued through the late 30s. Right. At which point it sort of ran its course? It had pretty much run its course by the time the, the, uh, the lawsuit came about, because, ironically, the, the production code, when it went into effect in 1934, in the same year, also affected the, the content of the cartoons. But yes. that was also affected by a policy change at Paramount as well. And so the last one that gave us a little bit of a, a teaser of what she was all about was, interestingly enough, called Betty Boop's Trial. Please don't make me take the stand in front of the jury. I'm not guilty because I never committed a crime. Please don't make me late because, you see, I'm an actress. I'm on at eight and now it's nearly my time. I'll do my best and 
hell. The case rests entirely upon you. Have no pity. Oh, oh, well, you. The jury will now retire. Not guilty! And then when she comes out victorious, she jumps up in the air, and when she floats down, her little skirt floats up, and, and she spins around, we get to see her nice little panties. The one final time, and then after that, you never see anything like that. <laughs>